Okay. Uh, first of all, I'll probably be a little longer, so if we have no time left for a question, I will be outside. Feel free to ask anything, because the talk is quite long. I'll try to make it as short as possible, but there are many things that I would like to say, and uh, some of them are long and complex, so I didn't have enough time to explain them in full. So I recognize that something might not be clear, so feel free to ask me anything. The reason, first of all, uh, why I'm here and what's the reason for this talk, I'm currently maintaining a few Python libraries and frameworks in the web development world for Python. The biggest project is for sure the Turbo Gears project, which for any of you that doesn't know it, is a framework that is comparable to Django Insights as admin, as multiple, uh, uh, how to call it, a database access layer, supports for both MongoDB and SQL Alchemy, as everything you might expect for a full stack framework. And has been around for like seven or eight years, so it's a very uh, big project with a lot of uh, pro other big projects that rely on it, so there it takes a lot of my time. And then a few other minor projects like Beaker, which is a framework for caching and sessions on web. And there are other side projects like DuckPy, which is a JavaScript interpreter for Python. You can use it, for example, to run a React server side on Python or to run a Babel.js transpiler on Python without the need for Node or things like that. And Depot, which is a file storage framework. So you can see that there are a lot of projects I'm maintaining. And the reason for this talk came from the experience I had as a developer of libraries and frameworks. So whenever you create something like a library, if you are lucky enough, it will be used, and then the, pro the real problems start. The effect is that most of these pieces, in which might be independent, start to get integrated into bigger software or other, other solutions that involve them. And it's not always easy to find a way to make them uh, interact with other pieces of software and communicate the design and the intent of what you wrote. I mean, you might expect that your library does something in a very specific way, and you do not expect people uh, using it in so some ways you didn't uh, foresee or things like that. And you try to do your best to enforce those ways and communicate them and things like that. But it's not always easy. So sometimes we need to revert to uh, more stricter enforcing to, to apply them. So uh, this is the most common situation I usually end up as a library, whenever people, as a library developer, whenever people open an issue, uh, nearly half of the times it's because they use the library in a way that I didn't predict or foresee or they didn't mean at all to be used like that. For example, the most interesting thing was recently an issue was open to me for Depod, which is a file storage framework, and there's a deep integration with SQL Alchemy. So whenever you, for example, commit your transaction or roll back your transaction or things like that, your files get deleted or saved for real according to the state of the transaction. So for example, if a user uploaded his avatar, and your uh, transaction fails because, I don't know, any kind of error, the avatar of the user is not left there on disk or on S3 or wherever you uploaded it. It's also rolled back with the transaction, so you don't leave around uh, broken files or things like that. And there was a guy that opened an issue about the fact that it didn't work well with Django RM. I said, yeah, of course, it's supposed to work with SQL Alchemy. It's the first word in the documentation and things like that. And then I started actually implementing support for Django RM because people actually wanted to use it on that uh, storage system, I would say. So, uh, you try to cover whatever it might be possible misuses of the library or the framework or the code you wrote. And you try to do that in documentation. You show people the way they are supposed to use the library. But it's nearly impossible to show them all the way they, they should not use the library. You 
if you try, like, I could write these works with SQL Alchemy and MongoDB, which is what I did. And then I could add more, one more paragraph to the documentation and say it doesn't work with uh, Django RM. And then probably someone will try to use it with Mongo Engine. And then I would have to say it doesn't work with Mongo Engine, only Ming for MongoDB. And things like that. You will end up trying to list all the cases, that, all the things that people shouldn't do, which is impossible because our you know, I would say unlimited. So you quickly discover that your definition of what's reasonable as a way that your library or framework should be used, it's not easy to guess, a common definition that any of one can share. So you don't know what to do anymore. I mean, I already did my best. I told you how to use the library, I told you how you should apply it in your project. I wrote examples, I wrote documentation, I even provided some sample projects and things like that. But there is always something you didn't foresee or didn't predict. So there is actually a branch of software development that comes into our world uh, regarding those kind of things. And it is, a, um, I would say, a kind of science that is called defensive programming. It's really common in really big projects, like if you need to write the software to drive the space shuttle, you will apply a lot of things that come from defensive programming, like uh, math proof of the requirements or uh, like double fallback systems for every single software piece you wrote or things like that. So uh, the purpose of defensive programming is to defend you from the impossible because it will happen. And the more formal definition which I took from Wikipedia, so it's probably, nowadays it's probably the standard definition is what you read on Wikipedia, <laughs> is that it's a form of defensive design, so a way you design your system, not actually the way you write it uh, on call level to ensure that it continues to, fu to function under any possible circumstance. Or if it doesn't work anymore, at least it should uh, notify in a clear way what's going wrong instead of just providing random error, which is usually what it happens. And there are a few things from defensive programming which we actually take for granted. We are used to them from object-oriented programming, from uh, aspect-oriented programming, from many other paradigms, like uh, uh, you have interfaces in object-oriented programming, you have like invariancy of types in functional programming. So all those things actually go under the umbrella of defensive programming, as they are a way to prevent you from doing the wrong thing. So like, uh, if you are subclassing an object that does those things, you are expected to do those things. Or if you are uh, working with a specific type, you are not expected to edit the object itself, which might have side effects, but you are expected to create a new one. And all those things are usually under, go usually under the umbrella of defensive programming. And you will notice that all the things that are involved in defensive programming usually uh, assemble protocols and expectation. So declare how you want to communicate with other piece of the system and what's your expectation in the way the other piece of the system will work, what they are going to do and things like that. For example, if you are a file storage framework, you are supposed to store your files somewhere. You are not actually supposed to provide, to have a, a storage in no, nowhere, which is actually one of the features that first got requested on Depot, for example. People started asking for a way to write really fast test unit that involved integration with Depot and say, hey, why we can just make Depot do nothing when you store something so that my test is fast instead of having to actually write the disk on the, uh, write the file on disk or upload the file to S3 or things like that. So, um, Whenever you, whenever you face a condition in which the software refuses to respect your expectations, you should provide a clear alert to the user that he is doing something wrong because you cannot rely on the fact that they read the documentation or things like that. And 
I will say that there has the software that uses your library as expectation out of your library. I expect that your web framework renders my page. I expect that your file storage framework saves my files. I expect that whatever you are doing does what it is expected to do. So your library should have expectation too. So you should have expectation in regard of how the user is going to use it. So try to enforce them because it's one of the major pain points when you start getting involved in many different projects that do many different things. And there are actually parts of the protocols enforcing which we are used to in our daily work. So whenever you write a piece of software, it doesn't need to be a library or a framework. It can even be just something you use in a single project, my baby in four different places of that project. At that point, you will have to provide the clear expectation, and you usually do that through interfaces, through signatures of your methods, types, assertions, and all those kind of things are actually a way to express a protocol. A protocol in the sense of how your object or your library interacts with other libraries and objects. And you actually need to provide the expectation for each single join that your library will have with other people's code. So any single piece where your library can interact with something else should enforce those expectations. And I'm not talking about the most obvious one, like my methods, if you call it, you are supposed to pass a number. That's, that's something we take for granted. It's obvious that if you expect a number, you should check that the thing that you are receiving at least resembles a number or can be converted to a number if you want to apply duct like, typing or whatever you want to work with. But I'm also talking with side effects, like uh, if you saw the previous talk from Armin, there was a clear problem of side effects in import. I do import, and I expect that what I find in this module C is actually the module that I imported. But there is nothing that it's enforcing that for me. It's just a side effect of how the import system works, and it's not actually supposed to work the way for real. Something else might have changed the content of CC import as a side effect of import. So those are all kinds of expectations that your library should enforce in the context where it runs in. And the fact is the context is pretty hard to define in something like a dynamic language. And in this case, uh, we actually have a few tools that can help us in many ways because the fact that it's a dynamic language has its side effects, like it's not always easy to specify the protocols your classes or objects need to enforce. Now we are starting to see improvements. They try to do abstract-based classes. They try to do type hinting in uh, more recent versions and things like that. But usually Python has a legacy of being a typeless language mostly. And, but the fact that it's so powerful and flexible in managing code and types also means that it has powerful and flexible tools to inspect what's going on, because Python itself has to do that. To be able to treat your objects as they are something, it has to have powerful tools to check what that something is. So Python provides us powerful infection because the language itself needs them for real on a daily basis. If you provide something that is expected to work on a sequence, you, and that's probably a case every one of you ever faced, you know that it's really hard to check what a sequence is for Python. We have a definition in collections. We have a, a base class that says I'm a sequence. But actually, for the general idea of what a sequence is, many types that do not expect, do not respect that, uh, that hierarchy, that uh, interface, are actually collections. So it's not uncommon in Python to see complex checking of what kind of methods or behaviors the file ex exposes or things like that. And we are really uh, used to in inspection in the context of debugging. Whenever your software crashes, you expect to be able to 
uh, go into the code and see what were the local variable, what was the previous frame, go back and forth across this call stack and things like that. All things that Python does because it's a dynamic language. If you ever work with a compiled language like C or things like that, it's not as easy, I would say. It's still possible somehow if you have an understanding of how the internals of the operative system and computer work, but it's not as easy to move across your stack of calls and things like that. At least you must know, for example, where in which place of the memory your variables will be or things like that. While in Python, I can just get the frames and from the frames, the local variables and here it is what made my function crash. And one thing that your library can do is leverage all these tools to inspect the surroundings in which it is running to check that the expectations are met. So I will try to show you some example to clarify the concept because so far it was a really theoretical talk. So I told you about uh, protocols and forcing of expectation, defensive programming and things like that. But in practice, what does it mean? How can we apply some of these things to Python? And I try to resemble some of the most common anti-patterns that we see often in Python. There are, some of them are really widespread, even though they are, have many side effects and things like that. And one of the most common side effects in Python, uh, which is related to the previous import uh, example is side effects at import time. We often rely on the fact that whenever Python imports a module, it runs the code of that module. So we tend to see like classes declaration and things like that, not actually at declaration, but actually at implementations of those that actually, when they get executed, create the class. And this is common, uh, for example, in the context of registering something. Like I saw people um, commonly use like decorators to register a global object, uh, to register an object in a global registry. Okay, like this, this might be a really simple example of something like that. It's really common in the context of uh, uh, event handlers and hooks and things like that. It's really common to see this pattern, which involves on having a, some kind of registry, which in this case is just a dictionary, and some kind of decorator that declares on which event your function should be called. So, for example, my decorator will register the function that you are providing as a handler for the event that was specified by the decorator. And then whenever I want to fire an event, I just look into the, all the registered handlers and call them. Like in this case, it just goes through all the event handlers for that event and calls them. And this usually ends up being something like this. So on event, some event, then my listener, and then I fire the event, okay? And there is one complex problem in this example, which is it works in the most common cases. It works in the case where your model gets imported and you register the event at the global namespace. But what does happen if I do something like this? I declare a factory method, which is, a, I would say, a pretty widespread pattern in many cases. And that factory method creates something that has an event handler. And here starts our problem. If I fire the event, I will see it getting fired if my factory was ever called before the event was fired. Or it will never be fired if my factory was called after the event was fired. Because it will never register the event handler. Because my factory never was called, so the decorator never was applied. And so my function never was called when I fired the event. And this is Okay, if you think about it, it's, it's fine. It's the way you, you know the language works. You say, hey, you never created F, so how could you register it as an event handler? It's pretty obvious at that point. But from the expectation of a new user of Python, it might be more obvious that I 
the register at that function as an event handler, and I expect it to be called because it's in my code. So this is an error that you might face if users use your globally registered event handlers. They might like open an issue on GitHub and say, yeah, I did this and the event handler never worked. And you will reply, yeah, of course, because you never actually created it. But it would be better if we could find that this is an error, and we could tell the user you should not be doing something like that. And it is actually a condition we can assert. So we can actually implement something that checks for that. So we can implement a, a register decorator that at least traps the context where it was used. So in this example, that we have the same exact register decorator, but we are using the inspection features of Python to check that the current frame, where the, actually the parent of the current frame where the decorator, where the event handler was registered, is at module level. So okay, this might not be the clearest way to do it. It might not be the most elegant way, but it works and it was short enough to stay in a single slide. And the, what I wanted to show you is mostly the idea that my event handler should be in charge of checking that it was used in the correct way. So in this case, it's in charge of checking that the place where the event handler was registered is not a transient scope. So it's not something that might or might not exist. It's something that will exist, okay? At least in the sense that you usually import all the modules as the first thing. Of course, it will break again if you use lazy imports, but they have all set of side effects, so you usually don't want to use them. So in the most common case, that it will work. And in this case, I trap the fact that the user registered the event handler in a scope that it's not global, so it might be there or might not, because the only scope that we know it's always there, it's the global one, actually. So, and I provide an error, so that whenever the user tries to use my decorator, at least it gets an error that says, hey, you are registering the event handler into a transient scope. Maybe I can add one more option and say, Yes, really do that because I know what I'm doing. I know that I will always call the factory before firing that event. But in the most common case, I should probably trap that and tell the user you're doing something that will cause issues to you. And this is the case, this is the scope of tools like static code analysis tools that usually do things like that. They check empty patterns. So everything you, show, you are not supposed to do. And they usually do that really well at language level because they know how the language is was supposed to do. But they are not really useful in the context of checking your code. So I mean, your code, sorry, that might be a misleading definition. The code that you write and there's expectation. It will check that your code uh, solves the expectation of the language, but it won't be able to check that the other libraries that use your code uh, solve the expectations of your code. Because you will have to write custom checks for that to happen. And in many cases, those tools are not really easy to extend. You need to learn a whole new framework. You need to write parsers and things like that because they rely on checking the the syntax of the language. They rely on checking the, the source code itself, not the runtime, usually. And there are many things in a dynamic language like Python that are not easy at all to foresee without actually running the code. And uh, if you ever use a development environment, like PyCharm as we are in the room, uh, you will probably notice that it's not always easy for your uh, uh, editor to guess the correct types or what's happening at the code because it doesn't really know what's going on when you run that code. It can try to guess, but it has no guarantee that the guess will be correct. And there are actually one more dependency that you must add to your uh, tool chain. So if you need to work on a new project, it's one more piece that you need to set up before working on that project. And as you try, uh, 
as you add more and more of those dependencies, it tries, tends to be a pain in the ass to start working on new projects and people start to complain and they don't want to contribute to the project anymore or things like that. So for an open source project, it's not always a really good idea. Okay, and here comes another powerful feature of Python, which is the inspection. And we have a full set of things that we can inspect at runtime. And the great thing is that you can actually inspect not only your code, but even other people's code. But the main problem with inspection is that it is really expensive. So don't try to do that at runtime. Usually you want to do that at test time, so while your test suite runs. And you can inspect actually anything in the language, not just objects, models, and classes. You can inspect even code itself, which is the really interesting part, because we can check what other people are doing with our objects and our codes and our function. And here is one simple example and that tries to explain you why inspection of the code can help you understand what's going on. Okay, so for example, we might have read the Python documentation, and it states that all the equality uh, operators evaluate from left to right at the same order. So we probably think that writing something like that, true equals false in false comma five, will probably respond with a, <laughs> a, a true value because we compare true to false, and that's false, of course. And false is in a list that contains false. So that might be an expectation that we have if we evaluate that expression from left to right, as the documentation states. But that's not actually true, because if we try to put squares around that expression, which should change nothing, because it should still get evaluated from left to right, as we just place the square on the left part of the expression, the result changes. And why is that? Well, it's not so easy to guess at first. So my first expression when I saw this was, why? And we have a few tools that might help us understand what's going on. One is the syntax tree uh, inspection, and the other is the bytecode itself inspection. The first thing that I'm going to show you is how to inspect the bytecode itself, so we can disassemble our function and ask Python, what's going on here? And we now clearly see what the language is doing. What's going on is that Python is going to compare true to false, and if that comparison is false, it will move away. Jumpy false means go away from what you are doing next and jump to 11.27, which is the end of the function. So it will totally skip the right side of my expression if the left side is false. And why is that? Well, if we go into the extra syntax tree, it now gets clear why Python is doing that. Because the expectation of Python is different than mine. Python expects you to write something like that to express an equality in the context of three different elements. So the operation, those are not two different operations. It's a single operation that is compared and it compares the left value to two other things using two different comparison operators. So you're not actually saying compare the first two and the result of the first two compare it to the third element. You are saying comparing the first element to this and then to that. And if any of the comparison is false, the whole expression is false. But what was misleading was the way that I wrote it because I used the in operator. If I wrote it this way, in the second example here, it would be clear to any of you probably why Python believe, behaved that way. Because in this expression, it's clear that we want all the three things to be equal, while in this expression, it's not as clear to, to explain that we want true to be false and also in the list that contains false and five. Okay? And now, in the simple expression, it's easier, but it's not always easy to guess what's going on until you go down to checking those kind of things. And now, I, I need actually to rush a bit because I have only like five minutes left. So the next example will be pretty fast. If you ever work with chiclomatic complexity, is how, how much complex your code is. So how many branches your code is taking. 
And usually a good limit is stated to be around seven. So if your complexity goes over seven, it means that your code starts to get too complex for humans to follow and read. And if we have something like this, we can, uh, which is just a function with two different branches, two different if branches, we can compute the chiclomatic complexity by decoding the code of that function, so ending up with something like this, which is the bytecode, and then checking the number of if and for loops that my code is running. So if the complexity that gets from that formula, so counting the number of if and counting the number of for and adding one, which is always the main branch itself, is over seven, we can provide an alert to the user that this should refactor. So we can use something like code inspection to enforce best practices to our code, like check that your complexity is low, refactor your code when it gets too long. We can check that, for example, the function is no longer than x, x different for loops, and we can say, hey, you did too many things into this function, you should refactor it. And then once you understand it, you are able to inspect what's going on around you. What should you do? The first thing that I suggest you to apply inspection is when you work on a big project with other members of the team. It's really common that in that context, there are some parts of the system that you understand very well and other people understand less than you because you are probably the main developer of that part of the system. And it's really important for you to be able to set expectation during the test of that part of the system. Because someone else might introduce bugs that he doesn't even know that it's causing because he doesn't know how your code works. For example, one of the most recent cases where I use inspection is this example. I try to explain it the best I can, even though I recognize that without the context of what was going on, it's not really easy to guess what's happening. Suppose that you have some code that destroys an entity, okay? So it might be whatever, a blog post, okay? It destroys a blog post, and the blog post has many attachments, every image, every video, every whatever you uploaded to that blog post. Maybe it does translation in other languages and things like that, okay? And we want to make sure that in any way the code that deletes the blog post is changed, it continues to maintain the assertion that all the resources that were uploaded with that blog post are deleted. So even if our code fails somehow, it doesn't left around pieces that were supposed to be deleted. In this case, what I did was writing a function, an helper function, which is called get methods called by, which looks at the bytecode of a function, of a method, and looks for all the other methods that were called by that function. So I did something like, okay, I know that this function does like 20 other things. Check that any of the other 20 other things that the function does doesn't leave around any stray file if that thing fails. And that was a really important enforcement because you know that when you tear down a resource, you expect it to be gone forever and you don't want to go and clean up things by hand because when you find them, it's usually really complex to understand anymore if they are still used or not. You have to go to all the dependencies and things like that. So in my test suite, I wrote a test that monkey patches every single method that was called by that method and causes it to raise an error. So every single method that was called by the destroy function, by the tear down function, now raises an error, one by one. And I check that causing an error in each single method doesn't leave around any resource. So this is a clear example of some expectations enforcing to the inspection of bytecode, because I did inspect the bytecode to find all the methods that the function was using, and then I just enforce the fact that each one of them shouldn't leave behind any resources if it fails. It can fail, of course, because we know that something might go wrong. We know that the connection to the database system might be down for whatever reason, and the user deletes the object in the exact, exact moment. 
but it will st it still needs to make sure that the data that was uh, stored there will be gone whenever the connection is back again. So, you didn't really expect me to <laughs> do a talk about code inspection without citing metrics, of course. And at this point, I tried to do the best I could to explain you uh, what's defensive programming, what's something you can do with code inspection in Python, and why you should enforce the protocol and the expectation of your libraries. What you need to do is actually not easy for me to tell you because it really depends on your project and the context of your project. I would say that it's already enough if you get out of here and start thinking whenever you write your next piece of code about how every other single developer in the world might misuse my function. That's usually the question you want to ask yourself whenever you write a new piece of code. Thank you. We've got five minutes for questions. If you have any question, raise your hand. We have a microphone for it, so it gets recorded. Uh, is, there, is there a library or something else that I can use to... Uh, sorry, I can't hear you very well. Yeah, is, is there a library or something else that I can use to implement the functionality that you showed in your last example to get, for example, the functions that are called by, on, by another function? Okay. Uh, not that I am aware of. The I'm pretty sure I saw something that does things like that. The libraries for inspecting the code or trying to look at the runtime or things like that. But they are not really oriented to enforcing expectations. So usually you can rely on them to, to get the context, what's going on. But none of them is really up to date usually because the Python backcode changes some, some time. Not really often, but from version to version, they might add a new operator or things like that. So unless the core developer is really committed to that project, he usually uh, gets behind pretty quick, like in one or two versions of Python. And so usually, in my experience, it was just easier to write it myself because when a project is uh, is implemented is usually bound to a specific Python version. Like you usually know that that project is going to run on Python 2.7 or 3.5 or things like that. So it's easier just to take for granted in the context of a, a project you do for work, of course, that that's the version you're going on. Obviously for a um, open source project, it's very hard. And it's usually uh, easier to rely on things like the inspection you know, frames, call stack, and things like that than trying to go into bytecode inspection itself because it might change. So I, I don't have a clear answer to your question because I know no good framework I would suggest you for doing that. That, that would be my point. I saw some libraries, but I never... Uh, ended up using well them for various reasons, so I have no enough experience in any of them to tell you it will solve all your problems. Thanks. So going back to your first example, mm -hmm. the register, where you register, I don't know, classes, uh, callbacks, functions. I yeah. agree this is extremely common. Every binding is doing that. Is not so clean. Also, agree it's not a clean. But what do you, would you suggest to do instead? Okay. Well, in this specific case, for example, there is a really uh, widespread library. You, you, every one of you probably heard of it, which is Celery, that does something like that for um, registering tasks. And if you ever work with Celery, and if you ever try to look at its code, you probably notice that it has also some pretty complex logic to try to ensure that it's finding all the tasks in any place of the code that you try to register. But still, there are many ways that your code might go wrong, and some tasks you... In that case, uh, I know very well for experience. <laughs> I, I saw that is the issue, because I have a single task takes a function as a first argument, and that function is actually the real task. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, I solved totally that problem, but I agree that design is totally Exactly. Wrong. So, for example, one of the things that you, I usually do to solve this kind of uh, problem is having an explicit registration phase on kickstart of the software. So, for example, for Celery, uh, we ended up writing some parts of task registration that ensures that whenever, the, uh, whenever you start uh, the software, all the tasks are registered at that time. If any task is registered at any other moment, it will crash. It will tell you, you registered the task at the wrong moment. So you should explicitly call a register task function in the startup function of the code. And that was a simple solution that didn't involve changing salary much. We just and had to uh, patch the task decorator to check that it wasn't called in any other place apart the startup function. And there are probably many other patterns that you can enforce, like Pyramid does something really complex. We, they have a, a library which is called uh, Venu Venusian, if I'm correct, that inspects all your code, trying to find any hook point in every single Python file in your code. There might be another solution of the project, but I guess that it will not be easy to catch them all. I'm sure that if I invest enough time, I can find a way to full pyramid in looking up into my code, probably. Yeah. Thank you, because it's similar to things that I'm doing to solve this issue, so okay. thanks. We don't, we don't have more time for questions. Uh, just a quick note on the EuroPython app. You can rate this app, thank the speaker, uh, and also provide any, any, any feedback you, you think it might be useful for, for him for better talks. So please thank again the, the speaker, Alessandro.